Good afternoon and welcome to the second presentation of the Interagency Brown Bag Lecture Series. On behalf of my partners, the Command and General Staff School, Colonel Scott Green and Mr. Marv Nichols, um, I'm Rod Cox with the Command and General Staff College Foundation. It's our pleasure to present this interagency lecture series to enhance the interagency curriculum here at the Command and General Staff College. If you've not gotten your cop latest copy of the Foundation News Magazine, please contact our office and we'll be happy to get you a copy. Today's presentation will be recorded for use by our distance learning and our satellite campus students as well as the interagency professionals around the world. So what I would ask those of you that are here in attendance, if you would please, to uh, if you engage in conversation with our presenter, just activate the microphones that are at your seats and so that your part of the conversation can be picked up on the microphones and recorded. To today's presentation. The ultimate high ground, space. As stated in our national security strategy, the U.S. must maintain leadership and freedom of action in space. In addition to our ever-increasing dependence on space-based systems and information, other governments and private sector organizations are continuing to increase their own actions and influencing in the domain. Our presenter today will discuss current and future space initiatives as well as the many government agencies invested in space operations. We're privileged to have today with us Mr. Thomas A. Gray. He serves as the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command's Liaison Officer to the U.S. Army Combined Arms Center and Army University. He has the responsibility for integration of space knowledge and education across the various TRADOC, Joint, and other service schools to include the U.S. Army's Command and General Staff College. A retired Army officer, Mr. Gray, was one of the first officers des designated as a space operations officer, and he served with Army Space Command, the Space and Missile Defense Lab, and the SMDC Directorate of Combat Development. He's qualified as a Level 3 Space Professional of the U.S. Army Civilian Space Cadre, and he holds the Space Operations Officer designation of 3 Yankee and has earned the U.S. Army's Master Space Badge. Mr. Gray holds a Bachelor's of Education from New Hampshire College, and he's earned a Master's from Central Michigan University. Please welcome our space expert, Mr. Thomas Gray. Thank you, Mr. Cox. I appreciate that. Uh, and welcome to everybody here. It's a pleasure to see the faces. Uh, and for everybody who's online, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, as stated, uh, Tom Gray, Army Space and Missile Defense Command. Um, which is really interesting because this is an interagency brown bag lunch. And so it's kind of disconcerting that I am not a member of an agency. I'm a member of the Department of Defense. And so the question, therefore, comes out, why me to do this? Well, because there are no representatives from agencies that de deal primarily in space here, and so I come to talk about the equities that they bring. So what I want to do is talk about the space domain and the integration from a Department of Defense perspective and those myriad of agencies in the U.S. government that do space operations or enjoy space operations or have some sort of equities. Now, I could easily talk about any agency out there, period. Because when you look at capabilities from space and how we as a nation are embroiled in doing business in this technological world, there isn't an agency out there that doesn't use space. However, what I want to do is just focus on a few and, and kind of talk about the equities that, that are enjoyed in that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, for example, like uh, NASA the National Reconnaissance Office, the D Department of Commerce, NOAA, National Oceanographic At Atmospheric Administration, and also the new Space Development Agency, uh, which has only been in existence since March of 2019. So when, I, when we dis look at the integration with Department of Defense, I mean, most of us think, you know, it's when you say space, most people say, NASA, and most people say DOD. I want to talk a little bit about the integration of all of that. 
and as a nation, how dependent we are on a space-based capability. And so when you start thinking about that and, and what do we do as a nation that relies on space and how we are able to achieve our strategic end states and goals as a nation, what are the capabilities that brings to that? So I will start with uh, satellite communications. I mean, communications is, is, the, is the foundation for any sort of leadership and exchange of power and the ability to gain common understanding. And in the rapid world we have today, it, it falls upon often the satellite communications. If you think about your television, you say, well, I have spectrum cable in this area. You say, okay, where does spectrum cable get the feeds? And they pull them down from satellite. So even if you think, I don't have a connection there, and then you think about just something as simple as, oh, I don't know, a cell phone. You say, well, that doesn't use a satellite because that just goes to cell phone towers. But when you're moving little ones and zeros on your computers, on your cell phone, the ability for me to do this presentation and address the students who are at home watching this on Blackboard, that is all facilitated by a space-based capability. And so if you say, I don't use space, everybody does. Uh, even today, people actually read a map. When's the last time somebody bought an atlas? I mean, no, no, no. And I come back to your cell phone again. You have some sort of GPS app with maps that gives you the route to go from point A to point B. But it's not just, it's not just the navigation piece. That is where we get global timing to the nanosecond. And that is what allows us to move ones and zeros in quantity so you can get high definition television, so you can get your high speed internet, so that you can actually walk up with your credit card into McDonald's and say, I want a Happy Meal, swipe your card, and they give you your Happy Meal because it's all the ones and zeros have already gone to the approving authority and already come back and said the account is, is good. And it's all because of global timing. Uh, and just when you think about in our nation, humans like rules and humans like boundaries. You have a territory and you own a piece of property and it is bounded by survey. People want to know that survey. In today's farming, a lot of your vehicles actually pretty much self-drive on a GPS program in the tractors. So when you start thinking about food production and those kind of things, how dependent we are as a nation, and who's involved in those kind of things? You know, Department of Agriculture, maybe. Uh, food and Drug Administration, maybe. So you start thinking, who are the agencies? Talk about the banking. Who are the agencies that are in that? The SEC, Wall Street, the ability to watch the Nikkei and then watch, you know, all the different markets and how it changes on a dime. And that happens because of space-based capabilities. Uh, you think about current, the world we are in today, uh, and we have been living for quite some time, as we watch uh, the threat of like North Korea and the growth of missile proliferation across the globe. And we have been understanding as, as we uh, abrogated the uh, Missile Defense Treaty from 1972 and said we can't count on just mutually assured destruction with just Russia. We have other countries out there and how do I know when they launch? Do I want to wait till it's just a radar as it's coming in on me? I want to be able to see when they launch because that gives me enough time to be able to act and react in response. So when we look at the threat to the homeland, missile warning, uh, even just uh, earlier this year, 
when we engage the Iranian general in Iraq, and Iran says, we are going to respond, and they launch missiles to engage our forces in Iraq, we had the capability to then give them early warning so they could be in the bunkers. Were there injuries? Sure. Were there deaths? No. And that's because we have the ability to do missile warning, not only here, but globally. And then you look at the best way to prevent things is to know things ahead of time. The eyes and ears in space that we have for intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, those, but basically understanding the threat. I mean, let's go all the way back to 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, you can do so much with, it, with, a, with an airplane, but air is sovereign. Just ask Gary Powers. And so if you really want to get the inside scoop deep in somebody else's area, you can do that from a space-based capability. And then, of course, today, for those who are in the Kansas area, we are enjoying a lovely day of 70-something degrees. Why am I in here? I should be out working, working on my yard. Uh, but when you think about weather and environmental monitoring and how critical that is for us, I mean, people are glued. There's an app for that. There's probably six dozen apps for that. Understanding the weather. And, and what it means to us, especially as we are watching climate change, as we're watching the uh, uh, oceans encroach onto shorelines, and what that means for uh, shipping, what that means for transportation. Uh, so when you stop and think a moment, how much do we as a nation and as a people depend upon space-based capabilities? And then when you look at the agencies and the departments and, and the organizations that are involved in helping put, move forward our nation, how are they using space-based capabilities? And then as I turn it around to Department of Defense and you're looking for a whole of government integration in order to be able to achieve the national strategic objectives. How are we as a Department of Defense working in concert with those other agencies in the, in the government in order to be able to achieve common goal from a common direction? And what type of capabilities do they bring to the table or don't have that we need to be able to provide? So as we're doing uh, planning, integration, here, but also in any other part of the world. Who else plays? How do they play? Where do they play? What are the capabilities? What are the limitations? So I could address this on several agencies, but I want to come back a little bit to history. Because space, being in the domain of space, is only about coming up, it's only about 70 years. You know, it's, it's, it's just, that's not much time. I mean, when you think about airplanes, you know, we're over 100 years on airplanes. And so space still kind of thinks about where we are. So there's some milestones to, to, to address here that's uh, kind of fun. Uh, going back to World War II, going back to looking at, you know, Germany and the V-2 rockets and, and how far they had to travel in rocket technology. And you look at Goddard and you look at, heck, go oh, even back further, Chinese with the with fireworks and, and uh, fire-propelled uh, munitions. And so when we talk about going to space, we really start with the Soviet Union in 1957, putting up Sputnik. The implications of this are tremendous for our nation from a strategic perspective. Because now, the Soviet Union could put a satellite in orbit around the Earth and they occupy the ultimate high ground, as stated by Mr. Cox at the very beginning. It is the ultimate high ground. And because it orbits, and it's way up there, what did we have to be able to stop it? Nothing. 
And so here when you're talking about Cold War period, the balance of power, the balance of power has just tremendously shifted. Now, fortunately, three months later, the United States Army launched Explorer 1 on a modified Redstone rocket called the Jupiter C. So now you have two world powers, Cold War, orbiting the Earth. What are the implications of that for our nation? So Russia first into space with a, with a satellite, and then, oh, by the way, first man into space. Yuri Gagarin was the first to actually go up into space. And then you say, okay, yep, Alan Shepard goes up. That's great. You're second. Glenn, uh, Senator Glenn actually gets to orbit. But then you say, okay, first woman in space, first spacewalk, Russia, Russia, actually Soviet Union, Soviet Union, great. But we got to the moon first. And if you look at it, we did that in 10 years. That's really interesting. If you start thinking about how how labored we put forth new systems now. I mean, you say, 10 years to do that. Heck, how long did it take us to, to, to build the GPS-3, which should have been gone up in 2005? So that gets to be kind of interesting of where's the priority, what's the priority? So when you look at this, uh, you see the, the business going forward of how this, this moves forward. So what I would like to do is then now understanding a little bit of history, a little bit of dependence, I want to talk about some of the agencies, because this is an interagency panel, that actually have primacy in space, or at least a good deal in it that's important. So when I say space as an agency, that really falls, it, most everybody says, and, and that comes to NASA, National Air and Space Administration. This was established in 1958. Oh, key date. Explorer 1 goes up in January of 1958. Who put it up? The United States Army. Why? Because we didn't have a space agency. You had the Department of Defense. The uh, Navy and, and the Army were working really hard to, to put, get satellites up in space. So realistically, the very first national space policy was the NASA Act of 1958. And NASA was stood up, and, and their mission, their mission was basically research and science. Let's go up, check out space. Let's see what it is, what it does. But even all the way back then, it was still a collaboration because the military had the expertise to do space. And if you looked at all of the astronauts, you know, the, the Mercury 7, those were all military test pilots types from the Navy and the Air Force and the Marines. And so when you're, you're looking at that, you, you already see a DOD and a civil, civil agency integration. That integration continues even today uh, when you look at what's going on with uh, uh, NASA, uh, especially for, the, uh, for space situational awareness, which is critical. Because now, with the U.S. SpaceCom, the focus is not just low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, and what's called geosynchronous, but it's also what they're addressing is cislunar. We're talking about going all the way out to the moon. And what are the military implications there? And NASA is also talking about going back to the moon so that they can project then off to Mars. So you see there's some synergy that plays with this. And part of that is also what's out in space? What are the threats in space? Now, not necessarily in this case, when you talk NASA, what are the threats in space as who's going to shoot down my scientific satellite? Talking about what are the meteorites? What are the things that are happening out there? If I'm going to put humans on the International Space Station, what is the best orbit to make sure that they don't come in contact with other debris that's up there? And what is the status of that? And so is this the United States military that actually has the radars, the telescopes, and the satellites in space, looking at satellites in space in order to be able to 
help NASA recognize that. Matter of fact, one of the things that uh, was just happening was uh, the uh, Department of Defense was tracking a refrigerator-sized meteorite that was supposed to impact the day before the election. Could 2020 get any worse? And so uh, that was a collaboration with NASA to be able to help understand what are, the, what are those kind of things. And so as, as you move forward, we share launch facilities. When you talk about Patrick Air Force Base, Cape Canaveral, we talk about Vandenberg Air Force Base, depending upon the satellite where it needs to go. And even now, you're watching uh, launches happening more frequently out of Virginia, a place called Wallops Island. And so with that, several places that are run by the Department of Defense are also shared by NASA, and NASA are shared by the Department of Defense. And so if we're talking about providing capabilities for the DOD, then there's some pieces that play in that. Uh, today, you can see that NASA is contracting to civilian corporations in order to be able to take our astronauts to the International Space Station. Matter of fact, we have four that just went up on, on uh, the Dragon space capsule. And so today, from a strategic power perspective, we're no longer paying Vlad Uber to bring our astronauts up and back. We're doing it ourselves. And they have recognized and are realizing a 25% drop in their space e economics just because of this. Uh, and so we're starting to see a lot of folks coming to the United States for launch because it's a lot more um, efficient, less expensive, and actually safer. So NASA is one criti critical organization. Uh, Another organization I'd like to talk about is the National Reconnaissance Office. Up until 1992, I couldn't even say NRO it was such a classified program. Now they have a gift shop. They do. Uh, and so think about this. We only went up in space in 1958. And already in 1961, we've established the National Reconnaissance Office because we recognized that if you are in orbit over a country, they can't shoot down your satellite because nobody can actually get out there then. And so with that, we established the NRO, very, very, very classified program. Nobody knows about it. But even back then, in the, in the late 50s through the 60s, space is considered, quote, unquote, a sanctuary area. You're, you can or, you're going to orbit over my country. There's nothing I'm going to do about it. And so it's, it's kind of sanctuary. Somewhere about the s early 70s, it started looking at a more competitive. Multiple players acting against each other. Uh, some of the things that are going on right now with the NRO that's very interesting. If you've been watching uh, SpaceX, and Elon Musk, he is launching out a constellation called Starlink. Starlink is going to be thousands of satellites, low Earth orbit, all meshed together to provide worldwide broadband. What a great deal. Say, you have folk, that if you go out into the rural areas of the United States, there is a dearth of broadband. How do you do online education when you can't even get a good internet connection. Now, we're looking at Starlink, and the Department of Defense is actually looking at how they can contract with that and use that system to be able to, to uh, integrate some of our DOD uh, command and control systems. So, that so what the NRO is doing is they're playing off of that and saying, you know, CubeSats are definitely going to be the way to go. Because if I put up a satellite that is about the size of a Greyhound bus, that is a big target. Easily engaged, as well evidenced in 2007 when China did a direct ascent anti-satellite and shot down their own weather satellite. And so now you have your ISR satellite, and we don't have a lot of them. Uh, the movies are a bunch of garbage. You know, they'd say, hey, give me a picture of this right now. No. 
when will the satellite actually be over the target based upon the orbit, based upon the Earth's spin, based upon all the sun, based upon angle, all those things come into play. So now what the NRO is doing is looking at commercial technology for their research development and technology to be able to perhaps design a, a constellation of small sats in order to be able to do their J-O-B. Much less expensive to launch, uh, much less expensive to operate, and a lot more secure in order to be pr provide the capabilities we need for our national security. So you're talking about the NRO and what they bring to the Department of Defense for targeting and for the integration that comes together to make this happen. And as the uh, supplier of imagery to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and the pr provider of signals to the National Security Agency. And I could have easily talked about those guys forever as well. We, we could probably do a whole course on that. Uh, so really working on CubeSats. And for the first time, we've actually launched uh, NRO satellites off of our own soil. We actually did a series of CubeSats launching in New Zealand. So there's a lot of innovation that's going on, a lot of changes going on uh, within the realm of this. And as you know, as you look at Google Earth, and if you look at your maps and all that, and you look at the imagery on that, that's all commercial imagery. Well, the NRO is now has a direct link with Planet LLC to actually bring that, energy, that imagery in through the NRO. So now you're talking about the integration of civil, agency, DOD, all tying that together. Now I was talking earlier about uh, um, junk in space, junk in space. And, and there is a shipload of that. That's a P. There's a shipload of it. We're tracking easily about 30,000 items up there, right? But it is a big area. But there is still the chance of conjunctions. And so for years, it has been incumbent upon the Department of Defense through what was then uh, Air Force Space Command to be able to provide the, the cataloging of all of the stuff, rocket bodies, fairing shields, uh, engines, and, and separation rings and all that, dead satellites, junk from the Chinese anti-satellite, to be able to track that from radars, telescopes, satellites in space, watching satellites in space. And, but now, what is happening, as you see, is when we as the Department of Defense want to be able to tell, oh, I don't know, let's say China. Hey, China, you've got a piece of junk that is coming in conjunction with your satellite, and it is, there is a possibility of an intersection. You want to move it. And China's going to look at you and say, you're the Department of Defense. You think I'm going to trust you? No. So what we have seen is within the last couple of years, and this is soon to go into effect. It hasn't gone into effect yet. But the actual um, integration for space warning of what's going on up there is going to be moving to the Department of Commerce. Why? Because it's about business and economics. I'm not telling you you're going to have a conjunction with your satellite because I'm worried about my defense. It's because of trade. And that becomes a little more palatable to those that are out there. And so when you look at the Department of Commerce, they have several lines, uh, strategic lines. But I think the one that really hit it is we're, we're in their strategic uh, goals and activities is expanding space activities. Why? Space makes a lot of money. There's a ton of it. As discussed, now that we can launch our own astronauts, we're launching our own supplies, and, and, and other, they're coming into our companies, and we're, we're bringing in OPM, other people's money, and you're building infrastructure, and you're building jobs, and you're building capabilities, and, it, and then, oh, by the way, the government can tax the crap out of it and build our own economic being. 
And so when you start thinking about that integration commerce, you can go back historically and think about, oh, I don't know, World War II, the Navy, primary job, protecting the commercial shipping and the merchant shipping, and that's what they were doing. Is, and so now you have to think Department of Defense, protecting our satellites and our ally satellites because our commerce and our trade depends so heavily on it, and that's why you have this good integration with the Department of Commerce and the Department of Defense. Within the Department of Commerce, you have the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration. I can't tell you how long it took me to be able to say that without messing it up. But NOAA, as an administration within the Department of Commerce, has a, has a huge piece within the realm of space because they are the ones actually operating all, all of our weather satellites and also integrating the information from other countries. For example, I think you've probably watched, the, maybe you've watched the weather on TV, I don't know, maybe not. I watch the weather on TV because I, I ride a motorcycle and I, every day I want to know if I'm riding tomorrow or not. But I get the US model and then I also get the European model of what the weather is going to do and forecast over the next few days. It's like, that's because they integrate all of that. And so understanding what's going on out there. And so the, the military has a Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, DMSP, which you see here. They also now have this EWS G1. That is an old, older geostationary satellite that NOAA ran all the time, but what they have done is they have drifted that out and it's over the CENTCOM area and it's a direct downlink for the military to have a big picture for, for space capabilities, but also their own defense meteorological program. Where the Air Force used to operate those satellites, they're all now operated by NOAA. So there is a DOD direct agency integration of space capabilities. Um, the last one I want to talk about is this new space development agency. It was just established in March of 2019, the SDA. SDA is a, is a civilian run organization, it's very interesting, uh, but basically what they are doing is they are looking out future based upon the, what we perceive the next threat will be. Uh, obviously, you know, we can all talk China, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. And then figuring out what is the space architecture we really need to go to. We've relied on, on systems for, for decades. I mean, for example, for example, over the Indian Ocean is a fleet sat, SATCOM satellite that has been in operation since 1989. And we use that, mostly in a backup mode. But when you think about it, how old is that satellite? And if you have to do a software update, what's the computer processor on that? Oh my god, does anybody still know how to program in Fortran? It's about a Commodore 64. Your cell phone can do better than that. And so what the SDAA is doing is looking at how do we need to posture ourselves in the near and far future for space in order to be able to support the Department of Defense and the nation? So you're looking at things, for example, like the transport layer. That is a low Earth orbiting constellation of satellites, think like Starlink, that is going to provide comms worldwide immediate access. You don't have to be able to say, can I, can I get over that hilltop and, and get out to that satellite that's 22,300 miles away? It's going to be in a higher low Earth orbit. I only need to go about 1,000 miles, and it's going to be like uh, cell phone towers driving past you instead of you driving past the cell phone towers. Talking about the command and control 
they're actually going to put in a layer that is actually the computer processing to do artificial intelligence in a satellite layer. So you get the comms, it goes through those, and they actually do the computations and, and pull the data that you need in order to, instead of sending it down, then you're doing it all down here. It's already going to be done up there. Unbelievable. Uh, tracking. Uh, currently looking at what's called wide field of view. Our missile warning systems that see infrared for boost of missiles are all the way out 22,300 miles away. They don't see cruise missiles. They don't see hypersonics. And that is the threat of today. And so they're working on uh, using a SpaceX bus for the satellite itself and then somebody else providing the uh, Raytheon actually providing the sensor, they're going to put in a constellation in low Earth orbit so you can actually see, track, to be able to engage hypersonics and cruise missiles. So we're increasing the, the fidelity of what we can do to protect the DOD and our homeland security. Uh, Targeting for tracking, the, so they're actually going to be put up, so once you detect it, then you have to have something that can actually track it. Send it to that, to that uh, uh, BMC3 layer to do the command and control, and then have the comms links to be able to engage. Looking at alternate PNT, because GPS is, you know, it's, it, it's the number one seller on the foreign arms market right now, GPS jammers. What can we do? if GPS is compromised in an area. So they're, they're looking at a, a way to do that as well. And so you can actually see this. Uh, one of the, uh, I highly recommend in open source, uh, spend some time online and just do an internet search on a thing called Project Convergence. Project Convergence is uh, something that's going on right now that's uh, very interesting. Uh, it is the strategic engagement of targeting within 20 minutes. A satellite detects the target. The information, it does the analysis through artificial intelligence, and then the engagement criteria is sent to the best solution. Uh, we just did this through land capability. Uh, they detected the target from space in uh, White Sands. The command and control element was at Joint Base lewis McCord, And then the engagement came from Yuma. And so you're talking about 1,000 miles. And it all happened within 20 minutes. In today's time, that's really important. You talk about strategic engagement. And that's the power that space brings to what we're doing. So there's, there's kind of a small look at just a few of the agencies that are up there, but when you start looking at that, you say, okay, so what agencies are out there? What is the criticality of a Department of Defense individual to be able to look at the mission? Where are you? What are you doing? What are the agencies that are involved so that you can get a whole of government response? I could have picked any agency out there. I just picked the ones that I just thought would be kind of interesting to start with. And so with that, I put forth to you that I think uh, as you go forward in, in the Command and General Staff College, but also as you go forward in the rest of your career, that don't just look at the planes, the trains, the automobiles, and the ships. What is the integration of the domain of space? Who else is using it? Who do you need to partner with? What are the capabilities that they bring? And what are the capabilities you need to provide from an interagency perspective? Because it is not just a military perspective. When you talk USAID, when you talk about NGA, DIA, EIEIOA, somewhere in there, everybody has a play. So with that, I will conclude my remarks and open it up in case there are questions. Uh, for those who are on Blackboard, uh, my IT specialist is going to just run this up and put Blackboard on there if there's any chat. I have missed it because I can't see it. But if you have some 
some chat questions that you want to jump in, I can do that. And anybody in the room, I'm happy to address any concerns you might have. If you would uh, just tap the mic and use the mic, because I want the people at the outstations to hear it too. It ought to go red. Devin's, uh, Devin's checking to make sure the mics are going to be working. There we go. It seems like the Space Development Agency is doing a mission that I assumed Space Command would be doing in, uh, what was it, Unified Space Development Across Military Services. So mm. what's the relationship there between Space Development Agency and Space Command? Sure. That is a great question. And so uh, what, I am, what I am projecting and what I'm thinking, and this is a, you can attribute me, and, and, and somebody out there will say, man, that, that gray is just so full of himself and full of everything else. Um, so here's what I think. As the US Space Force is standing up, it has what are known as field commands, all right? You have the, the, the uh, Space Operations Command, got the Spock. Uh, you have the uh, STAR Command, uh, Space Training and Readiness Command. And then you have also a command that is not stood up yet, uh, the, and it's the, uh, it's basically, you know, Force Comm, TRADOC, RDT and E. I think this field command, I think SDA will end up going over and being that field command. It will come out from being an agency. It will no longer be run by a civilian. It will be run by a three star. And you'll have the space, uh, uh, sustain, say, space support command that will actually do this. So it will fall under the US Space Force, who is the Title 10 train, man, equip, organize, that kind of thing. It wouldn't fall under US Spacecom, it would fall under the Space Force. And I think that's, that's where that's, that, that I believe is what is going to happen. Great question, thank you for that. Yes, sir. Sir, as we commercialize space and start to move away from government and also military applications, what are the implications for the overall worldview of space as a domain? Yeah, that's a, that's a real good question. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because it, it, it's, been a, it's been addressed here uh, for some time. There was a move, oh gosh, probably about nine, ten years ago, where they said, why do we, we even need a National Reconnaissance Office? Why should we even be spending all this money on all these uh, surveillance satellites when the commercial companies are out there doing that? We can just use their stuff. We don't have to do that. Why are we even building uh, uh, satellite communications radio, uh, uh, sat satellites when you can just buy it from the commercial guys? You don't have to spend all that. You just buy it. And so I think there is a move afoot that there will be more integration of that. Uh, again, it all depends on cost. It's kind of like watching, it's like watching NASA and the launch, all right? Uh, why should NASA go through all the machinations of building capsules to launch people when I've got commercial companies doing it and, and they'll just charge me their Uber fee? So um, I believe, I believe uh, our government agencies and our Department of Defense uh, and, and just humans as, as a rule don't always like to depend on somebody else. I like to know that I have my own secure capabilities. Uh, so I believe you will see more of what you're saying. We will be doing more of the commercial stuff. We'll be doing less of the military stuff, but the, the less of the military stuff we're gonna do is not going to be the, the big box satellites, but we will be doing a lot more of the CubeSat constellations because we're finding out how uh, how we can integrate them and how well they play. That's why we're using a, a SpaceX bus and a Raytheon sensor for the wide field of view. So as we go forward, I think you're going to see a lot more of that happening. So that's a, your, your observation is probably pretty spot on. 
Sir. I think this question is asked of, of uh, every single uh, uh, space uh, subject, subject matter expert who's uh, given some kind of a talk like you. So I'm gonna ask you of you because I'm interested of uh, what your take on this is. From the DOD perspective right now, everything that's uh, associated with space is highly classified. Even the courses here that you teach are TSSCI level. With the commercialization of space, uh, with the uh, industrialization of it, with uh, everything that you've just talked about and even the questions pertaining to, okay, everybody wants to be out there yeah. and it affects our everyday non-classified lives of citizens. How do you see this working out between, uh, you know, uh, where everybody is going to space and DOD needs to have some kind of a control over it and uh, the fact that we see everything as highly classified and everybody else as Elon Musk said, if he could, he would totally just put it on open source, uh, you know, the, uh, the design of the uh, Dragon capsule, you know? Thank you. Yeah, and, and you are addressing that exact same thing that the Chief of Space, General Raymond, is talking about now, and General Hayden, who had been the, the STRATCOM commander, talked about uh, earlier. Uh, and so what is happening exactly as you're discussing is that that is being addressed right now that we, we as a, a nation and we as a capability need to start um, bringing it down. We need to open it up more. That, you know, the discussion, why is, that, why is that even top secret? I mean, really? Is it? Should it be? I mean, th doesn't everybody know when that satellite's going overhead? Yes. I mean, sources and things like that. So what's happening is, is there's a lot of classification that things are, are, are getting scaled down. For example, for example, at the Combined Space Operations Center at Vandenberg Air Force Base, key word, combined, means who else is in there? So not only do we have some five eyes, we also have Germany and Japan in on the floor of the Combined Space Operations Center. So what you're seeing is, is it is opening up more. At the National Defense, uh, uh, National Space Defense Center is Schriever Air Force Base. That is also a combined piece because we have partners that are in there. And so you're watching this, uh, you're watching the things start coming down a lot more. For example, uh, I can't talk specifically about the system, even just to be able to say, we can do an engagement of a satellite space control from the ground, I can actually say that. So before, uh-uh. It's kind of like NRO. It used to be really dark. Now you, now they're, you can say NRO anywhere you want. Uh, so matter, uh, uh, in, the new, in the news just the other, just, uh, oh gosh, la last month or whatever, or two months ago, uh, General Raymond talking about space situation awareness. NRO, new satellite in orbit, and they're talking about Russian satellite co-orbiting with it, and what's it doing? And it had, it had fired off a space torpedo, whatever that is, but understanding what are the threats to that, and so the, the classification levels are coming down, uh, but it's just gonna take time. It's gonna take time, but it is far more open than it used to be. Matter of, fact, matter of fact, I will tell you, in the National uh, Space Defense Center at Schriever Air Force Base, it is not only uh, coalition partners, there's also commercial companies in there as well. So that tells you a lot. Great. Chat questions. Participants, you, you want to hit down here on the chat and see if there's any chat that's come up? Nope, nothing. Good. All right. Uh, at this point, Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I appreciate it. Tell your friends about it. Go forth, live long and prosper, and, and do, do wonderful things. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Tom. <laughs> appreciate the presentation, very uh, eye-opening. A lot of things happening in space. I wanna thank everyone who is here in attendance for joining with us today, and then I also wanna thank those of you that are watching uh, this presentation remotely. I wish you all a joyous and safe Thanksgiving. Everyone stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.